so yeah thanks everyone for joining this especially with everything else going on so i appreciate people uh, making the time to join good stuff okay uh <clears throat> yeah so good morning everyone um so even before all of this kicked off um we'd been talking a lot in the uk about the fact that um in one form or another the, the 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 type of construction that we do over the next 10 20 years will to some extent is going to define uh what humanity looks like for the for the centuries to come so i'm sure you all know this already uh construction contributes up to 40 percent of carbon emissions either through embodied carbon in buildings or through uh operational carbon um, UN predicts that world population is going to top out 11.5 billion. So there's another 4 billion people on the way, um, all of whom we have to provide good quality housing and education and social infrastructure, transport infrastructure for. Um, it's almost certain to lead to some form of intensification of um, urban living, maybe less so, maybe things will change actually following what's happened now and people are starting to learn how to work more remotely, but um, it's undeniable we're going to have to build an awful lot more infrastructure and buildings much, much quicker than we've ever had to before. And I think the generation that follows knows that if it if we don't fix this, they're left with probably problems that can't be solved. So every previous generation got to hand the problems on to the next one. Um, our kids, my kids, kind of know that they're left now with problems that are, are going to be insoluble if we don't do something fundamentally different and that's happening at a time when again i'm sure everyone knows this uh construction productivity has been flatlined for decades even the most sophisticated construction still looks relatively biblical uh, aging workforce that is likely to be exacerbated by by what's happening at the moment so we're left with a, a, a problem where we have to build more better quicker faster than we've ever had to at a time when our capability is now so disconnected from what we need to do that, that i think that's a, a huge problem that we should all be considering um, every other sector has solved this through some form of automation so agriculture industry mining printing every other sector has adopted some form of automation and construction i think is probably the last sector that throws thousands of people at a problem working in often physically uh, poor conditions, certainly mentally uh, destructive conditions. And again, we need to do something fundamentally different, we think, if we're gonna, gonna have a you know, sector that's fit for purpose. Um, so this is why Bryden Wood was set up 25 years ago, uh, for those who were listening to the sort of pre-call. Um, Bryden and Wood, Mark Bryden and Martin Wood, uh, were both architects. I'm an architect. I was employee number one, so I've been on this journey for a quarter of a century now. We were uh, discontent with construction in the kind of the form that it was at the time when we started. And a lot of the things that we were unhappy with are the things we're still talking about, the poor productivity, uh, the lack of change in the way we fundamentally build things. So we we set out to uh, small though we were, sort of try and create a picture of what the future construction would look like. And we always had this sort of underpinning thing of not just doing a better job of individual buildings, but using our capability to try and change or improve societal outcomes uh, for everyone. So rather than try and sort of create one-off beautiful buildings for individual clients, we said, how can we create systems that would allow us to build uh, schools and hospitals and housing and things at scale and get a much more kind of manufacturing-like mindset into construction? So this is a snapshot of 25 years worth of things that we've worked on. Um, you'll see here there's no one form of design for manufacturing assembly or modern method of construction. We've created volumetric systems, uh, flat pack componentized systems, we've created uh, or we use timber, steel, concrete. So we're agnostic as to form of construction uh, and sector and material, but we've developed a sort of palette of techniques that we've been trying to bring to bear and trying to create, as I say, these kind of more manufacturer led uh, ways of working. We've tried very, very hard to be cross sector, which for a long time was really painful. Um, on the basis that there's bound to be things that we could learn from one sector that we could cross fertilize into another sector. So one of the kind of problems we've, we uh, perceived was that the sector is very, or the industry is very uh, discipline focused. So people are either architects or engineers. Um, then people are very sector focused. 
and we work on projects where you have an executive architect, concept architect, uh, facade architect, interior architect. So even the you know within disciplines, people are starting to fragment. So we think that's a massive problem that people are seeing only one uh, part of one sector and one discipline. And actually, the sort of stuff we need to do sits across all disciplines, sits across lots of boundaries. So over 25 years, we've moved from being purely a firm of architects to having our own uh, mechanical, electrical, civil, structured engineers. We now have industrial designers, product designers. Uh, we have coders. We have analysts, VR people, robotics experts. So we've sort of been gra gradually uh, gathering this sort of vast range of capabilities, which are now well beyond what's normal in the construction industry, because we think you know the problems we have to solve are too big for the people who are trained purely to think about about buildings. Um, over the years we didn't used to express it in these terms but as i say we've always been trying to create uh kits of parts that allow you to do very very site specific uh content specific buildings but using completely standard components so this happens really well in automotive um when you buy a car you can now pick the the trim the finish the interior fit out the type of engine all the extras the specials so you get a very high level of customization but it's using the same components the same process each time so what we've been trying to do is sort of generate kits of parts that allowed people to make uh, individual unique buildings while still getting all the benefits of that manufacturing process and one thing we hadn't sort of quite articulated was uh, there was a sort of commonality to some of these components that an idea that we had for airports would morph into something we did in pharmaceuticals, that would morph into something we did in hospitals, in schools, into housing. Um, and we're gradually getting to a point, we think, where we're starting to understand the kind of uh, overall kit of parts that you might need. So we now confidently say to clients, we will take out 30% of capital cost, 20-25% uh, of program, the buildings we make will be higher performing, better quality, uh, easier to maintain, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. So we're demonstrating massive benefits for individual clients. And what we're trying to do now is kind of scale that up. It's the obvious question that we've been asking over the last few years, if, if the things that we're doing are so beneficial, uh, if it's such a better way of working, why isn't everyone doing this and why are we still having to do this in a sort of fairly um, case by case basis? So lots of people jump to automotive as being the sort of exemplar of people that do this well. So I often use automotive examples. I'll use some throughout this talk. Um, there was actually, though, I think people don't necessarily know there was a, nearly a 30 year gap between the invention of the first automobiles and Henry Ford doing them at scale. So the first automobiles were luxury handmade items. Not many people could afford them. Uh, they did nothing to the transportation market. It took Henry Ford to apply scale and repetition and start to get this kind of industrialized methodology that, that moved things forward very, very quickly. So I think we're still on the left-hand slide. I think we've got lots of people with uh, their own systems, their own ways of doing things. Uh, like us, they're creating benefit for individual clients. I think what we collectively need is to make that shift from the left-hand side into the kind of Henry Ford uh, type of scale. Um, the other thing I think that, that uh, people sometimes struggle with is when we talk about industrialised construction, this is people's mental picture. So they straight away go to the you know high levels of automation and robotics. Um, I personally don't think automated construction will look like this. Um, there's a cost density to phones and cars and aircraft wings, thousands of dollars per cubic meter that allows you to invest in robotics like this. Buildings are mostly commodities, so concrete, steel, they're mostly air. So we'll never hit, I think, a cost density uh, that means that we'll apply ro automation in this, quite this format. And if you're making a phone or a car, you can have a robot that's bigger than the thing you're making. If you're making a building, you can't, we're not gonna have 200 story high robots uh, running around. So what we've been trying to uh, maybe establish over the last couple of years is what is the appropriate level of automation? And what does it look like? And hopefully I'm gonna show you some of those examples today. And the other thing I've, I've mentioned this earlier, we've been uh, using IKEA maybe as a kind of uh, exemplar of somebody who's done this well. So prior to IKEA, 
Um, furniture tends to be expensive handmade items, much like construction now. Uh, IKEA came along and suddenly your supply chain of furniture manufacturers is billions of people around the world because everyone can make an IKEA piece of furniture. Um, the thing that really unlocked this was the little knockdown fittings and the screws and things. So whether you're making a bookshelf or a chest of drawers or a bed, uh, you know, whatever it is, you probably use the same components at the junctions. And that's the thing that's really allowed IKEA to, to unlock, again, a level of standardization, a component level that's allowed them to do all the other things that they've done. Um, and the analogy my wife uses, which I think is really good, is that if you go to IKEA, you don't buy a fully made wardrobe and strap it on the roof of your car and drive it home and hope it doesn't fall to bits on the motorway. Um, you buy it as a kit apart because you know that that's you know, a much more efficient way of doing it. You can get six wardrobes in your car. Um, when you get home, you don't make the wardrobe in your driver in your garden and then go, well, it's, you know, it's pretty good. I've just got to get it in the house and up the stairs and things. You take that kit of parts to where the wardrobe will be and you make it there and then. So again, there's something in that we think about um, not necessarily driving everything off-site, which is a hot topic in the UK at the moment, but trying to create factory-like conditions on-site and get exactly the same efficiencies that you get at home when you build an IKEA wardrobe, but at, at building scale. Um, so we started talking uh, with the government here a couple of years ago now, a few years ago, about this idea of platforms. Um, so we've deliberately stolen the term platforms from automotive and software. So probably everyone knows in automotive, um, the major manufacturers have a single chassis onto which they, they uh, bolt all the other components. So automotive has been doing this sort of platform component or platform approach for years now. Um, and we wanted to replicate that in some way for construction. And everyone knows the kind of software uh, platforms. It's the, it's the, the, um, thing that's transformed the world certainly over the last sort of couple of decades is the wide adoption of this sort of platform approach. Um, so we started saying we did a thought exercise with uh, some of our government departments. So I've been working with the UK government for a decade now. Um, I mentioned earlier that kind of sector focus. So we said look, that's one of the things that's holding up the the industry. But if you plotted everything that government buys on that graph and you didn't consider buildings by sector, but you consider them by technical performance. Every space you buy lives on that graph somewhere in terms of the size of the room and the height of the room. So if you plotted them all, you could then imagine drawing a sort of lasso around a sort of small scale uh, residential kit of parts that would be good for uh, secure accommodation for Ministry of Justice. It would do single living accommodation for the military. It would do student accommodation. You can imagine a kind of mid-span kit of parts that did schools and uh, offices and housing and things and a big empty shed kit of parts and you'd be done. So with a tiny number of uh, components, you could build you know, billions of pounds worth of government uh, social infrastructure. So we've done this exercise for real with the departments and that thinking has proven to be true. So for instance, lots of buildings have a floor to floor height, which is a person tall plus a zone, plus a zone for sort of uh, structure and MEP and things. Um, uh, that sort of height, it means you can get natural daylight about eight meters into a building. So lots of buildings have a sort of eight meter span, not because they're a classroom or an apartment building or an office, it's because they're built around people. So again, lots of the kind of uh, standard performance things aren't driven by sector, they're driven by people's needs. And again, it's why this sort of kit of parts approach starts to work across multiple sectors. So we've been developing this kit of parts and I'll show you what some of these things look like. Um, we focused on broadly superstructure, envelope, fit out and MEP. Um, superstructure is not the biggest bit of the cost plan of a building by any means but we talk about it as a carrier frame. So it's an enabler of other things. So lots of people can make a millimeter perfect facade system, but they spend a lot of their time filling in the gaps between their millimeter perfect manufactured components and the kind of wobbly piece of structure that they're supposed to bolt it to. So we've been looking at if you can make a superstructure, which is uh, very, very accurate, goes up very quickly, it's easy to imagine the rest of the kind of kit of parts clipping into it. Uh, we've been working to get fit out and MEP to be much more integrated and conjoined. 
so a lot of the building types we work in are um, you know pharmaceutical facilities hospitals and things we end up with enormous wasted uh, volumes of air where you have the kind of zone for ceiling finishes then the zone for lighting then for cable trays then for ducting then for pipework then for structures so we've been trying to compress those things into much smaller spaces and treat them like products which means we get uh, lower floor to floor heights and therefore less envelope and therefore less building volumes there's a kind of uh, chain reaction of things that happens through getting this sort of much more integrated approach so I won't talk about all of these things I'm sure you can download the slides after but uh, once we've developed those kits of parts we then spend a long time looking at how to really optimize them so I've talked a little bit about reducing building volume uh, our thinking has always been if you had a kit of parts that was uh, highly repeatable the more effort you put into that kit of parts the greater the benefit you get if you've got a component you're going to make a million times then every gram every process every manufacturing step you take out of that has a million times multiplier so we spend a lot of time looking at uh, how little material we need to make the components how we can optimize the design of it how we can optimize the manufacturing assembly and we're trying to underpin all of this with automation which i'll show you so this is um platform two this is our kind of mid-span uh, platform that we use for schools buildings for apartment buildings for small offices etc um, so things to note on the bottom right that's a completed prototype actually uh, which we'll come back onto in a second the end result's not weird um, so we're using concrete for the slabs we like concrete for slabs because it's good for fire and acoustic separation uh, and at the price point it's a you know very good material we like steel for columns because it's small in section size we can hide the steel within the wall build-ups and things um, so the end uh, superstructure is not strange it's not using bizarre materials it's not using kind of unusual techniques but the way we assemble it is quite different so in the UK if you buy a fabricated steel frame uh, from a steel frame provider it's about two and a half thousand pounds uh, sterling a ton if you buy steel direct from Tartar it's about 800 pounds a ton it's so the thing you wanted was the performance of the 800 pound a ton steel the thing you pay for is for that to go from a uh, tartar to a stockholder to a fabricator to a specialist welder to be brought to site to be assembled by very expensive craftsmen you know piecemeal you know one bit at a time every junction is designed from scratch um, so we use literally standard steel sections that we buy direct from tartar we have one hole punched or laser cut into them and they come to site like the IKEA kit parts uh, we buy the spanning element is thing called Comfloor, which Tata make by the mile, so it costs pence. Again, that comes to site, IKEA kit of parts. All of the intelligence goes into those brackets on the left-hand side. So those are our IKEA kind of knockdown fittings. Um, so our supply chain for those is very, very broad and very resilient because we're not buying them from specialist uh, steel frame fabricators. We buy them from specialists who can do laser cutting of steel. So actually these brackets, these ones came from a really tiny little, uh, very local provider to the place where we built this prototype. Uh, they were very cheap because they were bought from someone who knows only how to do stain, um, CNC laser cutting, bring them to site. And then uh, the reason they're colored is that every single interface you ever need has a particular bracket. So you only ever need those brackets, whether you're Heathrow Airport building an airport or a primary school building a school, you're using exactly the same brackets. So our supply chain is uh, massive commodities uh, producers. So the large steelwork fabricators, Lafarge Holcim make the concrete and teeny tiny local companies, all of that gets brought to site and gets assembled by a team of people who are trained how to assemble those components so in this case this prototype was actually built by uh, prisoners this is up, up a prison in the north of England so no construction training no uh, previous skills whatsoever but we taught them how to assemble each of those components and this superstructure is millimeter perfect uh, performs incredibly well and it's about half price compared to traditional construction so we've got a thing which uses the same materials but less of it more accurately 
with a completely different supply chain and it literally costs you half the price and goes up very quickly. So we're getting tons of benefit without fundamentally changing the kind of the, the nature of the end product. So this is data from one of our government departments. They told us at the start of this process that of every pound they spend, about 50 pence ends up as residual asset value. The other half disappears. So some of that into positive things like supply chain profit, but most of that is waste, rework, transactional cost, inefficiency in the system, uh, materials that get wasted. So nearly half of every pound they spend disappears into kind of non value adding activity. So we said, look, you could uh, first we'll reduce the cost of the thing by optimize the materials, but actually we'll get rid of massive uh, costs simply by making the process more efficient. So again, the IKEA analogy, if we have the least amount of material handled the fewest number of times by the least amount of people who are working productively, that must be quick and cheap. So this is where our clients are sort of living now. Um, we have libraries of digital components, um, which we'll talk about later, which can be then configured by design teams into individual projects. And then the physical components can be bought by a wide supply chain, assembled by a low skill supply chain and brought into projects and you can see on the right hand side which bits we're eliminating uh, which bits we're protecting which bits we're optimizing but we're just simply getting rid of a lot of the kind of the lower bits of that so the risk uh, the overheads the transactional cost the inefficiency in the system uh, we're actually reducing design fees which is a weird thing for a team of designers to be doing but um, we're trying to focus everyone's efforts on the most value adding really creatively challenging bits not the kind of generating schedules and generating the kind of bulk uh, information that that takes a lot of time but doesn't add enormous value so these are some of the benefits we're getting um, on the left hand side this is for a large residential client that we're working with on the left hand side was the base design of one of their fairly typical units on the right hand side is the same thing design platform two um, so firstly we're using a lot less material which is good um, we're now working with steelwork suppliers to only get you steel which has been made in electric arc furnaces powered by hydrogen fuel cells. So we start with less material and then the carbon content of the steel is about to collapse, not really quickly, but it's coming and more and more steel providers are looking at electric arc furnaces. So the embodied carbon in the steel is about to get much, much less. Um, and we're working with Lafarge Wholesome and Agri Industries and major manufacturers uh, to then specify concrete that has either SEM free or geopolymers. So again, we start with less material and the carbon content is about to uh, very soon drop dramatically. Um, so we're already probably 20% less carbon than traditional construction. That's about to get down to something like 90% less. I think we'll get to a point where in the UK where we can't make mass timber because of the climate, we have to get it in from Northern Europe. I think we'll have lower embodied carbon than timber construction, which is a bizarre place to be, but without some of the drawbacks of timber construction in terms of the uh, accuracy and susceptibility to fire and moisture. And uh, if you have a timber building, then you can't ever burn the timber because it releases the carbon back into the atmosphere. So we think we'll get to a point where this is the most sustainable form of construction. Not sure we're there yet, but it's on the way. Um, we're already getting market feedback saying this is at like least twice as quick. Um, so these are not our numbers. This is from a tender we did for the same residential com contractor or client. Um, all the contractors said, yeah, it's about twice as quick. And because of the systemization of it, we can start the fit out much quicker, which means we can hand over assets much quicker. Uh, there's all sorts of financial benefits to doing that. Um, this is platform one. This is actually built on the bottom right there. That is a uh, new type of prison that we've designed and that prototype was made completely by prison industries. This is one of the reasons the UK government's dead interested in this, this way of working. So one of our big problems is uh, skills gap and ageing demographic. To the government, if you weren't reliant on your current skills base and you could use the building of uh, public sector works to create new jobs, create manufacturing uh, opportunities to upskill prisoners, reskill prisoners, your 
labor base suddenly becomes X unemployed, X services, X military, uh, suddenly your skills gap disappears, your demographic problem disappears, and you create a, you know, a massive manufacturing base in the UK. So to their credit, they allowed us to try it with a team of prisoners, which worked incredibly well, actually. So we're now working with uh, our Ministry of Justice to deploy this across prison industries that we can start to, to create new opportunities for people. Uh, cost reduction I've talked about, but we've had a um, lot of independent verification on the costs. We're looking at about overall about a 33% reduction in capital cost. So the superstructure alone is about 50% less, uh, facade is about 40% less, MEP a bit less, fit out a bit less. So overall we're looking at a kind of 33% reduction, but that's still, you know, if you think about the amount of money that needs to be spent on um, infrastructure, that's you know, billions, trillions of, of dollars or whatever your unit currency is. Um, the other thing the UK government has recognised is currently on the top is how they procure things. So they go through cycles of buying lots of schools, and then no schools, then lots of schools, then no schools. Um, they recognise if they were buying the same components, so think of those brackets, whether it's schools or apartments or offices or airports, uh, rail stations, then you'd get into a cycle of a kind of base load of demand for the components, which would mean manufacturers could gear up and start to invest, which means the cost would start to plummet, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. So um, there's enormous benefit in adopting standard components, which is exactly why IKEA does it. Uh, we're currently investigating, you can see on the left hand side, again because the repeatability is components, we're now using automation at component level. So we're working with ABB and Comal on how to get robotic welding into the, the, the kind of smaller components. On the right hand side that's a piece of work we're doing to uh, automate welding of some of the spanning components. Uh, we did a thought piece uh, 2018 and said this is what we think a building site of the future would look like so this we think is the level of automation which would be appropriate on a construction site so not big robots as you can see these things are called reach stackers they use them in distribution sheds around the world um, so our hypothesis was with a team of four people you could build almost any size of building you like um, or with more people you could build incredibly quickly but you can see here the plan was to have limited numbers of people a little bit of uh, fairly basic automation and you could suddenly dramatically change people's productivity and you could change the way you, you build these things the idea here was that no one ever walked on this slab until the slab's gone off so everything is installed from below uh, and then we use robotics to, to level the slab and things uh, cut to this year this is our um, prototyping facility. So another unusual thing about Brighton would we actually prototype some of these systems. So this is a system developed by, for Landsec. This is platform three but it's the same thinking. Um, so this is for London. We've actually got a London office which is on site at the moment. Um, this was the prototype but again you can see that automation brought to that, that animation brought to life so we're using a uh, little bit of automation some kit we bought ourselves pumping the concrete uh, we developed a little robot that levels it we're working with uh, Lafarge Holcim on self-compacting super low carbon concrete uh, drop the components and then move up onto the next floor and the next floor so we're planning to build a 10-story office building or it's on site now uh, with maybe five six people building the superstructure working at an incredible pace and you'll see here in a second all of the MEP fixing points already cast in so you can imagine the MEPs are kit apart and clips into position and, uh, and off you go. Uh, I'll speed up now because of the, the time this is the this is that project uh, the site photos don't look that exciting at the moment this is an animation that shows how it goes together but you can see the kind of repetition you can see that kit of parts approach if you peel off the skin it's the same elements repeated time and time again uh, these are some of the metrics we're getting. I get bear in mind this is our first uh, project with this client. So they're a company called Landsec. They're our biggest private developer. Um, so the figure on the left, the seven and a half percent net lettable area increase, that alone is worth a vast amount of money to them, given that they're you know they sell office space, let alone the ten percent capital cost, fewer people, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So we're expecting those metrics to get uh, better and better as we go. But as a first shot that's not a bad place to start uh, and architecturally we haven't compromised this is a um, 
yeah, CGI the building so it doesn't look like a building that's designed using incredibly standard kits of parts. It doesn't look like architecturally we've had to compromise the uh, design aesthetic to get all of those benefits that we've seen on the previous one. So the other bit that we've been working on is uh, what are the tools that we'd use? So if buildings were no longer designed from scratch, if they were configurations of components, it would unlock all sorts of interesting uh, potential for automation in the design space. So if every component knows all the rules around it, you can then automate the way that they're put together. So we've been developing a whole load of different um, uh, very rapid workflows, digital workflows. So one thing we could do is take the normal design process and make it a bit quicker. We go, could do. Um, it's probably a more interesting thing to do. So we've been working on using that speed to test more ideas and get a better outcome. So we can actually end up with a better design building and a better optimized building much, much quicker than you can design it manually. So whereas a human design team might test one or two ideas, we're in the space of testing hundreds or potentially thousands of potential solutions. So we've developed a whole range of uh, digital tools to do this. Again, some in the building space, some in the uh, infrastructure space. I can't talk about all of these because of time, but I'm gonna talk about this one, which was the first one we launched. Uh, we put it out last year. So we were asked by the Department for Education to solve a problem they had. They have to build an awful lot of schools and each one of them requires a design team to be appointed to do a feasibility study, um, take some time, take some money. Because it's a feasibility study, they were finding very often there were problems sort of hard baked into the design. So when you went to do the proper design, you found you couldn't quite fit seven classrooms and so you end up with a smaller classroom, etc. Um, so we said what we should do is understand the rules that drive uh, schools design encode that in some way and turn that into a configurator that means you could design a school incredibly quickly uh, and it could only be correct it could only be have you know the right accommodation because you've you've encoded that in the rule set so i had a, I had a sort of secret interest in um engaging the, the next generation so my personal view there's a whole generation of you know we talk about imagine a world where we're co-creating we're doing things digitally we're building things using standard components and you go that's minecraft like that's the only way my 10 year old knows how to work and my seven year old if we don't make the industry look like something they'll want to work in they won't come and work in construction they'll all go off to tech companies and there'll be no one left to design our future infrastructure um, so we had a real interest in how could we start to use some of these tools to engage a, a, a generation that already know how to use them and kind of prove that some of the, the things they're doing already have a place in construction. Um, so when we developed this tool, uh, we, pro we beta tested it on my then nine year old. He can now design you a code compliant, uh, completely coordinated school in about 15 minutes. His younger brother spends about half an hour because he spends a lot of time putting things in the playground and making the playground quite interesting. But um, we literally, we took this into a school, filmed the kids using it to prove the point that actually there's a whole generation who with literally five minutes training know how to use this. So it's open source, uh, it's web-based. You literally go in, pick any site you like uh, in the UK because we've got the data for that. Um, you decide what type of school it is. It gives you a kind of digital kit of parts. You then place those components. They can only go together in pre-configured ways. You can't put a classroom on top of the hall and things. You can only build a compliant school. Uh, you can go into the school in VR. You can export the, the data, uh, turn it into a bid model and off you go. And literally this team of kids uh, all did completely different, really interesting site-specific schools with five minutes training. Uh, we've got more sophisticated versions of this for housing and other sectors, but uh, there'll be some links I'll show you later. You can by all means go and have a have a play. Um, for some of our clients, we're in the space now where, for the right building types, we've actually got uh, genetic algorithms that will create every conceivable layout of uh, a building or a master plan. So rather than try one or two ideas, it will generate every single idea that possibly meets the brief. And you then optimize by saying, well, can I choose the ones that have the best access or the best energy balance or the least amount of interconnection between the buildings or whatever it is. So you get a huge search area of ideas and you then optimize for the things that you think are important. And it says, ah, you want this layout. Um, so as I say, we're now at a space where we can generate 
much much better design outcomes much much quicker than human teams can so for the stuff we're doing for highways um, we can design a stretch of highway in two days uh, and do a better job than the previous human design team who took six months and 25 people so we're changing the way that you know some of these design processes happen within government departments now uh, and we've then got workflows this is there's a, an app called prism which is the housing app we now have a workflow that you can design a housing scheme in 20 minutes um, every room knows the lighting and the MEP and the doors and the wall types and the windows and the furniture and things that within it parametrically so it kind of stretches as you do the design creates this um, configuration file which is quite looks quite nice anyway uh, you can then use that to pre-select all of the structural components the MEP components etc so you design it in a web-based app in 20 minutes you create this kind of data set you then have a I think it'll show in a couple of seconds a data set listing literally every component where it is its orientation so from that you could go and you could buy the building you could you know, install the building we don't need the BIM model but if we want the BIM model it's generated from the data set so whereas BIM used to be the kind of you know center of the diagram with everyone looking at it BIM is now one view of a data set uh, but this model that pops up in a second it's kind of LOD 300 400 uh, the entire workflow from getting a blank site to creating this model takes half an hour um, so again we wouldn't ever do it in half an hour we would use that speed to do lots of simulation looking at overshadowing and energy balance and 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 and, and you know we'd end up designing lots much, much better uh, we think very very site specific you know better design buildings and better response to context but again using completely standard components so last things I'll just whistle through because I'm kind of taking longer than I, I plan to uh, where do we think this is going I mean you can see hopefully from this that uh, this approach potentially touches on every aspect of, of the life cycle so you've seen a, a couple of the digital tools uh, we're doing these in highways we're doing them for uh, lots of different building types my guess is we'll get to a point where these tools will start to talk to each other um, so rather than design roads and where to put transport uh, networks and things all of that will be derived from millions and millions of iterations of simulations that will say well here's absolutely the best place to place the roads and the best place to put all the connections and here's where to put the hyperloop and the housing and here's what housing to place there so I think we'll spend as much time and it will be seen as a creative activity developing the algorithms as it is in actually designing now uh, so humans will spend more and more of their time working on algorithms and you know designing the building types that don't yet exist so what does an airport look like when there's no baggage because your clothes will get 3d printed everything's biometric there's no tickets passports don't know yet someone's got to design that so I think we'll uh, change the focus of where humans spend their time uh, you can imagine uh, as quickly as you're modeling something you could be getting a price for all the components this zometry is a thing that exists in manufacturing at the moment so the companies at the bottom upload a requirement for components zometry has a network of manufacturers all of whom can see that and reply zometry puts together a supply chain on the fly gets your price you press the button and the components turn up you could imagine that happening as quickly as you're configuring your model it'll say here's the cost of the components and here's how many miles those components would travel and here's the um, health and safety record of the nearest suppliers and things so you can imagine a place where you're automatically getting the best price the logistics happens automatically in automated vehicles that arrive on site at the time when you need them and when it won't stress local infrastructure so you can imagine the digital bit stitching all this together and fundamentally changing the way we think about buying components You've already seen some of this that's only going to keep getting better and better uh, we've got some thoughts on the next levels of automation but you can imagine a, a, a point where there's very few people on site and buildings are just going up incredibly quickly and very safely um, this is a proof of concept building uh, the idea was it's a hotel that you can reconfigure over time you can take the, the bits apart i don't think we'll get anywhere close to this but my guess would be we'll build superstructures that have a kind of 100 year lifespan are maybe a bit more loose fit 
facades will change on a 30, 40 year life cycle, uh, fit out will change in a five, 10 year life cycle. All the bits will be reconfigurable, recyclable. So we'll stop thinking about buildings as permanent assets and think of them as current configurations of a kit of parts that could easily change purpose, function, uh, you know, lots of things over time. So I think we'll start to think of buildings as being a bit more um, flexible in, across their use. And of course, you can imagine then if every component has all of its uh, life cycle data attached to it, you know what you can reuse it for, where you can repurpose it, how you can recycle it. So we'll, that will be, I think, one of the things that will properly help us start the kind of circular economy. And our desperate hope is that everything people do will be open source. Um, so as Brydenwood, we have never protected anything we've done. We've open sourced those web apps. We've published everything we've done. Uh, we actually had written into our contract with governments that anything we do for governments, government has the ability to use uh, royalty free worldwide for anything it likes, which is the closest we can get to formally open sourcing things. Um, so we're trying desperately to give this stuff away on the basis that going back to the first slide, you know, there's no point in us being the cleverest people on the cinder. You know, everyone needs to be building like this. The more people built like this, the more benefit we'd get. Uh, and everyone's seen the power of network effects in Uber and Airbnb and uh, Netflix and the things. You know, every time someone does this, uh, creates this network effect by by gathering people, the benefit grows exponentially. So the impact that we're seeing, this is a document the UK government published uh, 2018. So the UK government has committed to uh, using its spending power to drive a kind of more manufacturing led version of construction. This is their document playing back exactly what we've said, digitally designed components, tick multiple sectors, multiple assets, uh, same component could be used for a school, hospital, prison building. So we're just in the kind of early stages of this, but we're now seeing uh, UK government certainly committing to this being their way of working moving forward. So they've mandated BIM, they're now saying this is what that's leading to. So yeah, I've been doing a lot of this sort of uh, talking around the world or talking from my, my study today, but um, yeah, we're, we're trying to sort of get the message out there. We think there's a, say, a sort of fundamental shift that needs to happen. We don't have by all means all of the answers, but we sort of think the work we're doing is hopefully a start for 10. We're encouraging people to take it, build on it, you know, uh, accelerate it. My personal view, there's lots of people in the industry at the moment doing their own little sort of clever thing and being very secretive about it. My view, if you go back to that first slide, the scale of the problem is so vast that we haven't got time to muck about anymore. We should all be uh, working much more collectively to move the, the industry forward. So we're sort of thinking of platforms as a movement and we're hopefully encouraging people to, to join us on the journey. Uh, so that's all from me. I'll, I'll, you can all by means have a set of these slides. There's a slide and I'll put them with a load of links and things. Hopefully that's sort of useful context, but uh, yeah, thanks again for your time. Hopefully that's been interesting. And I don't know if we've had any questions about that. So uh, Jamie, uh, the chats are coming in saying impressive, wow. Uh, so you, you probably aren't able to see all those right now, but um, I had a quick question for you, which is, can you tell me a little bit about safety um, on the job sites? One of the things that really impressed me is that in the slides that you showed, I didn't see one person bending over. I saw everybody standing up straight and lifting things, which is sound, runs so counter to the way that we think about construction. Have you um, done any studies or do you have any information about what it's like for the people on site? Uh, yes, we've got, yeah, obviously I could talk for ages about any one of these topics. Yes, we've got loads of um, data from uh, the work we've done. So one of the things, as I say, we often use kind of low skilled people uh, and but highly repetitive um, tasks, which means we can spend an awful lot of time planning those tasks. So we have sort of ergonomic studies where we do literally the modeling of, you know, how, you know, the, the uh, ergonomically making sure that every component is where it needs to be. Uh, we can then model that. We can do animations. We do a lot of VR training with potential operatives. Um, some of the bits that well we work in, people can't read, but they've all got a smartphone. So we put data matrices on components and you ping it and it says, right, next up, you will need a torque wrench. It looks like this. You'll need a friend. You'll need a purple bracket. And you literally 
keep pinging it and you will build yourself an antibiotics factory in Nigeria. Um, and we've got, given the places we work, we've got an exemplary health and safety record. So we've delivered things in the middle of Heathrow Airport, which is a nightmare complex site uh, that were completely, you know, there were no lost time injuries. There were no reportable incidents. There was literally no kind of... Um, health and safety things. I talked earlier about the not building the slab until or walking on the slab until the slab's built. So a lot of our time and effort is spent thinking how few people do I need? How much can I control their environment? How safe can I make it to work in, uh, enjoyable to work in and all the rest of it. So yeah, we have fewer people which immediately helps and we spend a lot of time making sure that every activity has been pre-planned so you don't turn up on site and ever have to guess what to do. Everything's been, you know, pre-thought through so yeah we have incredibly good uh we've won health and safety awards a number of times in the uk particularly wow okay so um i'm going to try and take as many questions as i can uh we have a question a question here from howard ashcraft he says jamie extremely interesting how has the uk design construction industry reacted to this approach a uh, limited experience in trying to bring even a lean process to uk has met resistance from many participants <laughs> uh yes it's been dead interesting, actually. So we've had, uh, we're, uh, you don't have Marmite there, do you? There's a, there's a particular thing you put on toast in the UK called Marmite. And the, the advertiser's slogan is you love it or you hate it. And we are Marmite. You can imagine there's some people who really engage with this stuff and think it's fantastic. And UK government particularly has been uh, a big supporter and a big advocate. And you can imagine there's an enormous lobby of people who, you know, see this as a massive risk, see this as a massive threat. Um, and we can never tell which way people are going to go. I think we, we tend to work with, maybe we attract clients who are the kind of more forward thinking clients, the GlaxoSmith Klein, Circle, Lansec, uh, Heathrow, Government. Uh, so we tend to work with people who are uh, more inclined to do this. We tend to work actually, Glaxo had worked out a long time ago, they said actually, um, this, old, this notion that risk gets passed down to the contractor is nonsense. If I don't open a pharmaceutical factory when I sell a wood, best case, it's costing me millions of pounds a day. Worst case, people are dying. Like That's not a risk I can transfer. So I need to step into this and kind of own a bit more of the process. Um, so the people who seem to engage with this are the ones who, like us, are dissatisfied with the current status quo, recognise big changes needed and are willing to, to, to put their hand up. But yeah, you're right. There's a whole load of people who go, oh, Bridenwood again. Just, you know, <laughs> and it's, I mean, yeah, we were, yeah, 25 years going. The last, first 20 years oh, were painful. And the last five years, suddenly everyone's going, oh, they might be onto something. And we've, you know, we're, I think we've got a critical mass of evidence now and a client base of people going, oh, yeah, they're probably right. But like I say, we're, we're putting the call out to try and find those like-minded individuals that are the, think this is a good idea and think they can help in some way. Yeah, well, I think that CIDCI is really committed to being that place of sharing these ideas and trying to build that movement. So I want to thank you. Um, Eric Law from Swinnerton asks, uh, curious about how the first project using the kit of parts is going. Can you provide more details of its progress? Um, so as I say, all of this is a sort of a, a culmination of things we've been doing for 20 odd years. So there's another set of slides I've got that shows the evolution of thinking we applied in the airport that then morphed into pharma, the, then into schools, then into houses and things. So, uh, yeah, the, kind of the first one of these probably happened in 2004. The stuff we're now doing is the kind of culmination of things we've learned in lots of different sectors. So we've got loads of different buildings all around the world that have been built using, uh, we probably didn't call it the platform approach. But there's nothing in the stuff we're doing now which hasn't been deployed a number of times across different sectors. I suppose the, the difference is this idea of trying to generalise it much more and sort of put it out across the, across the world. Um, so yeah, there's loads of things we've done for Glaxo, for Heathrow, for uh, public sector where we could say, look, that was you know, a precursor to this. I think it's this idea of trying to give it away and get other people to adopt it and build on it is, is maybe different or we're being more proactive about that this, this time. Um, we have a question from Christian, uh, Christian Tausen in uh, Denmark, actually. Uh, can you be more specific on how your platforms can address the need for future flexibility? Here I am particularly thinking about design for disassembly and the circular economy. 
Uh, so we work on the basis if it was easy to bolt together and it was easy to assemble, then it's probably easier to disassemble. Um, so the, the, I talked about the superstructure being the kind of carrier frame. Uh, as I say, my guess is what we'll do is build the kind of superstructure, you know, we'll make it potentially a bit looser fit and build it for a kind of long term and then everything else will be kind of clipped in place. So we've already got facade systems that you can dismantle and you can uh, reuse. We've got fit out kits that you can do the same. So I think all the kind of the, 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 the fit out, the MEP, the facade probably will be more likely the bits that we disassemble or reuse or repurpose and we'll leave the superstructure. You can obviously take the superstructure apart uh, more easily than you can a kind of you know, traditional RC frame. So you can either design in bolted connections that you can get back into and disassemble. We have actually done buildings, entire buildings, where they were built, uh, taken apart and reconfigured and built somewhere else. We did one for the Met Police where we built it as a temporary building while they built the kind of proper police station and they took that one apart and reused it. We did a thing for Heathrow where we built a thing in the middle of the airfield. So we have built buildings that have been dismantled, repurposed, reassembled sometimes for a completely different sector. Um, I wouldn't say every aspect of platforms is designed to do that yet, but it's certainly a, it's a, a very good starting point, I would suggest. Uh, we have a question here from Hitesh D1. Hi, Hitesh. Uh, do you have any... Hello, Hitesh. <laughs> yeah. Do you have any live stream, live blog where we can follow along to watch the 10-story tower project develop? No, that's a good point. We haven't yet. We should do that. We have got, uh, I say, I'll ping, I'll send you a thing that you can send out to all the attendees that will have a bunch of links. We've got loads of videos and things on uh, Vimeo of, of stuff we've been doing in this space. It's a really good idea, actually. We should do that. We have got, we had, uh, when we do the prisons work, we had a live web link so we could see what the prisons are up to and we could watch that. Uh, yeah, we should do that for the, for the Lancet building. That'd be nice, actually. Great. Uh, okay, we have uh, Michael Barden. Hi, Michael. Um, uh, client enthusiasm is partly a function of how design and construction solutions address perceived human needs. In your experience, what is the moment or tool in this process of design and presentation that best communicates to clients how their human needs are met? And how do you see that moment expanding and evolving? That's a huge question. Uh, so, <laughs> uh, so we have... Uh, uh, yeah, let me know if this answers the question. So we, we've been doing a, a thing with clients for a long time, actually, where we call it swimming upstream. So we started this probably 10 years ago in a healthcare client where we'd said to them, look, we know that we can design your building, it'll be quicker and it'll be cheaper, and da, 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 but it could still be completely the wrong building in the wrong bit of the world because you wrote a terrible brief because how would you know where to, to place hospitals so we started getting that's why we started getting this sort of team of data analysts and uh, you know, data visualizers and people we have a process where we started engaging a much bigger group of stakeholders much earlier in the process um, so GlaxoSmithKline <clears throat> for instance every global capital project for GlaxoSmithKline comes through our office and they don't come with a brief they come with a problem statement and they say, I want to get to, say, 80% of the African population by 2020. What do I do? How does that work then? What, what do we do? Um, so we started by, yeah, saying, don't give me a brief. Tell me what your problem is. Yeah, so we started the process of uh, clients not coming with a brief, but coming with a, a need. Uh, and then we work through that with a group of stakeholders. And actually for Glaxo, more often than not, the answer is not a new building. It's to you know, uh, optimize something they've already got. Um, part of that we started then giving GlaxoSmithKline free space in our office because we said look the modeling happens so quickly now that you need to be next to us so we formed these uh, blended teams of some of our people some of their people some subject matter experts and we found actually then people would kind of mentally leave their badge at the door and not be representing any company they'd be representing the problem and work through it and then we found other clients going where do I sit so we've now got an entire floor of our office where we don't work. It's all uh, co-location collaboration space for our clients. And we've had the guy who was our main client at Circle Health has left and works at Bryden Woods. The guy who was VP head of global projects for Glaxo has left and works at Bryden Woods. Um, so very often we get a potential clients. We say, look, don't talk to me. Go and talk to John who used to do your job for Glaxo and he'll tell you what this process is like. 
uh, and we host dinners where we don't go but our clients go so we pay for the meal send them off and go you lot go and chat amongst yourselves about how you're feeling how this is going uh, what we're doing well or badly so we're sort of creating this cohort of uh, clients with parallel needs who swap stories and you know they get comfort from the fact there's other people get on this journey and uh, it's incredibly powerful that potential clients come and meet existing clients and go what do you think about it then because uh, I don't know many consultants who might encourage clients to talk uh, to each other so that's how we've done it is by creating this sort of community of people who are on this journey uh, and saying yeah you're with us we're all with this together so off we go I'm not sure if that answers the question but that, that's how we're uh, yeah it's a slightly different conversation we have with our clients maybe than, than other consultants that, that's extraordinary I've never heard of that before um, uh, we've got one last question here from Ray Boff um, have you integrated product lifecycle management systems into your current workflow uh, no really uh, We've dabbled with it. We've done things that are like it. We've done probably our sort of uh, yeah, self-developed organic, slightly <laughs> rubbish version of it. I wouldn't say we have yet. It's one of the things that we're working with. There's a, there's a um, piece of investment in the UK. There's a thing called the Construction Innovation Hub, which government's funding, which I'm the design lead for, which is bringing together manufacturers and uh, digital and some of the stuff we're doing. Um, so I think what we've probably tried to do is create a little space into which manufacturing could step. So we know quite a lot of people have come in from automotive into construction uh, and said, I do automotive, how hard can this be? And you go, oh, it's going to be quite hard. Um, what we found is lots of people from automotive, if you had a factory making houses, they could make it better, but they didn't invent the, how, the, you know, the automotive factory from scratch. It already been going for decades before they arrived. Um, so I think there's a bit of a disconnect between what manufacturing knows and what construction knows. What we're trying to do is create the space and go, you can imagine if we were building buildings like that and using components, that's where you could really leverage your knowledge. And I don't think we're quite there yet. So we're creating a space where you could apply PLM and you could apply you know, manufacturing execution systems and all sorts of things. I don't think we're there yet, but we're trying to create a kind of a bridge. In my head, there's a, it's like Indiana Jones, there's a little rope bridge between manufacturing construction and it's thin and it's spindly and it's a bit rickety. What we're hoping is that, you know, with everyone's help, we can make it thicker and wider and it becomes a sort of super highway, but I don't think we're, we're there yet. I'd say we're in the, in the foothills. So we're now at 11 o'clock and Jamie, I wish you could see, um, well, you will in a moment, uh, the chat response from all the people on the call. People are here uh, all around the world are just so enthusiastic. <laughs> so I, I just, I feel this enthusiasm. I've never seen so much popping up. Like, this is amazing. So I wish you could, I wish you could feel it. I um, feel the energy that I'm really seeing from everyone here. So I think on behalf of CIDC, I'd really like to thank you so much for your time. Uh, you've given us so much to think about. About, and I'm sure it will be the continuation of further conversations because we're a community of innovators and people who want to try things, uh, try to do things differently. So I think that we're we're very simpatico in our ideas. So I want to thank you so very much. Um, and for those of you on the call, um, we're going to put as much information as Jamie will give us up on our website with links back and forth. So don't worry about that. Um, and we encourage you to, to stay in touch with him. Um, uh, our next salon is going to be on May 5 with Rex Miller discussing what getting back to work might look like and you'll everyone on this call will receive an invitation for this event. Uh, thanks so much for joining us um, and uh, as always if you have thoughts ideas or comments please reach us via the CIDCI website contact us link and thank you to Monica Swistler for helping us out today. Thank you Jamie. <laughs> no, thanks a lot. Thanks okay, for staying on we'll the call. Thanks for listening. <laughs> thanks so much. Thanks a lot. Bye. Cheers all. Have a good day.